Hey Prodigal, we're so excited that you joined us today. Today we're actually going to be taking a break from the series we've been in called Kings and Prophets to explore questions about doubt and certainty with our guest speaker Stephanie Bentham from Neighborhood Church in Visalia. We're so excited to hear from her later. If you're new here at Prodigal, we'd love to get connected with you. And one of the best ways that you can do that for us is to download our Prodigal app and fill out one of our virtual connect cards. The app is also one of the best ways for you to stay up to date with everything that we have going on around here. Next week is Trunk or Treat, and we're super excited to hang out after service. We're going to have some trunks for kids to get candy. We're going to have some carnival games and some food trucks. So don't forget to invite your friends and family. It's not too late for you to sign up as a volunteer, and we'd love your help and support. So if you can, head over to our app or our website to sign up. Coming up on November 6th, PC Kids is going to be having their Pajama Sunday. It's going to be like one of our Sunday fun days, but the kids are going to show up in PJs. They're going to watch movies and have popcorn and candy. It's going to be a real blast. This is also a great service opportunity for PC Kids. So we're encouraging all of our kids to wear one and bring a pair of brand new pajamas that we can donate back to kids in the community in need. So mark your calendars for November 6th for Pajama Sunday. If you'd like to give to Prodigal Church, there are a few ways you can do so. You can head over to our app or our website under the giving tab, or you can use the giving kiosk or the giving boxes out in our foyer. Thank you so much for your generosity, and we're really glad that you joined us today. Have a great Sunday, church. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Will we hear praises he hears faith? There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's word As he walks into the room Where people play
sing his praise alone. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise alone. Sing his praise alone. Hey church, you may or may not notice that my family and I are on vacation. We are not here. And a couple of years ago, I had heard about this great preacher from Visalia. Uh, she was working at a church called Neighborhood Church, and I'm close with one of the pastors there, and he was just raving about her, and I heard nothing but good things, and then I heard her speak. Uh, I heard one of her sermons, and I was just like, we've got to bring her to Prodigal Church. And so we are so blessed to be able to have Stephanie Benton here at Prodigal this morning um, to share God's word with you all. And I'll be watching online and I can't wait. And so would you give a warm Prodigal Church welcome to Stephanie Benton. Well, good morning. Last week, Jordan did a phenomenal job kicking off this teaching series on certainty. And if you missed it, you really need to go back and watch it because it was awesome. And he talked about how easy it is for us to be 100% certain about something and yet 100% wrong. And I can tell you with absolute confidence that every decision I have made in my life, I thought at the time that it was the right decision. I was certain of it. If I had thought it was the wrong decision, I would have never made it. And yet, looking back, I can tell you I made a lot of wrong decisions. I mean, there's some people I dated that I thought were perfect for me, and they weren't. And there's some friends I thought were totally trustworthy, and they weren't. I mean, there were people I thought were awful and annoying, and then I got to know them better, and it turned out I was wrong. I mean, my husband, Paul, and I met online in our 30s, but it turned out that we had mutual friends and should have met multiple times throughout our 20s. And as great as that might have been, we are both fully convinced that if we had met then, we probably never would have ended up together. See, Paul is a crazy good dancer, and I just don't have the confidence to bust a move in front of other people. I mean, at one point, he had eight-inch Mohawk Liberty spikes, and I probably would have been, like, embarrassed to be seen with him. I mean, I went to a private college, and at one point, he told someone that he would never date somebody from that college because they were all stuck up. I mean, we were both absolutely certain we knew what would be best for us, and yet we were dead wrong. I mean, have you ever had that happen to you? What you thought you knew for sure turned out to not be true. I mean, it causes you to question everything. I mean, what else did I get wrong? What else can't I rely on? See, doubt and uncertainty creeps in, and that's just not a fun place to be. I mean, many of us hate it. We want things in life to be certain because certainty feels like security. That when things are clear and outcomes are predictable, I can depend on them and life feels manageable. But when things are uncertain, life feels chaotic and out of control. And I think that's why we often cling to certainty and we hate to admit when we're wrong because feeling certain gives us a feeling of security. On the other hand, some of us have been burned by certainty. The things you relied on most turned out to not be true, and it was so disillusioning that you're distrustful of anyone that claims to know anything for certain, because nothing in life is certain. See, I think certainty is kind of like a teeter-totter. On one side, you have people that cling to certainty. They know exactly what they believe about everything. They are 100% confident and they are not going to waver or compromise their beliefs. And they will defend them to the death. On the other side, you have people that are certain that nothing in life is certain. Everyone has their own truth. And to claim that you know the one right answer is just arrogant and closed-minded. And these two views are diametrically opposed to each other, just like a teeter-totter. That if one goes up, the other goes down. If one is right, the other's wrong. If one wins, the other loses. See, often these two types of people can't play together because they both refuse to budge. And both these extremes are dangerous. 
people that are sure about everything are surely wrong about something and they'll never know it or admit it. And they're also usually arrogant and they attack anyone that doesn't agree with them. And they're just not fun people to be around. On the other side, you have people that accept anything as truth. Truth is whatever you want it to be. It doesn't matter if you're wrong, if you believe it, what right have I to tell you it's not true? See, the danger in this view is that you run the risk of being deceived or gullible. You might believe something that isn't true and that can have dangerous consequences too. A child that believes they can fly might jump out a window. And there are some things that are true, like gravity. It doesn't matter how open-minded you are, you will still fall. See, both sides of the certainty teeter-totter have their risks, and both extremes can be dangerous. So, if being certain about everything can be a bad thing, and being uncertain about everything can be a bad thing, then what do we do? Well, I think the journey of a guy named Nicodemus can help us. See, Nicodemus was somebody that met Jesus. He was part of the ruling council. These were well-educated, wealthy, powerful religious men in Jesus' day. And Nicodemus would have been certain about what he believed. He spent his whole life learning the scriptures. He knew them backwards and forwards. His life revolved around practicing those religious rules and making sure that other people did too. And then one day, Jesus shows up and he starts doing miracles and claiming to be the son of God. And it doesn't make sense. I mean, on one hand, for anyone to claim to be God is ridiculous. But on the other hand, this guy can do miracles that no one can explain. And suddenly Nicodemus is uncertain of what he believes. He has questions. But the rest of his friends on the ruling council don't question anything. They freak out because Jesus lives in a place called Galilee. And the scripture said that the son of God, the person Jesus claimed to be, is supposed to come from Bethlehem. So he can't be from God. Therefore, his power must be from the devil. And they label Jesus as dangerous and they make a plot to kill him. They were certain about what they believed. They didn't stop to ask questions. If they had... They would have found out that, in fact, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And this small technicality didn't actually disqualify him. They let what they thought was true blind them from seeing the truth. And they stuck to their beliefs, and they were dead wrong. They thought they were defending God, but they actually made a plot to kill him. See, certainty can be dangerous because it stops us from really listening. We could end up attacking the wrong enemy. But unlike his friends, Nicodemus was uncertain. He had doubts and questions. And so he went to see Jesus at night. And they have this strange conversation. See, Nicodemus is looking for answers, but Jesus tells him, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Basically, you won't get any answers unless you're born again. And you may have heard the term born again Christian. And it comes from this passage. What the heck does it mean? I mean, that's what Nicodemus asks. How can someone be born when they're already old? I mean, come on, Jesus. Surely you're not being literal, but what are you trying to say? Then Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. The flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Now, if you're like me, that answer is just as confusing as the first one. Jesus is using all kinds of metaphors here to challenge Nicodemus' thinking. See, he thinks he knows what's true, that he has been taught the truth since he was born. But Jesus is telling him, you have to start over just like a baby. You have to relearn everything. It's not that everything you learned was bad or even totally wrong, but your knowledge has led you to this place where you miss the point. The knowledge of God was supposed to bring people into relationship with God and harmony with other people. However, people like Nicodemus, the ruling council, the Pharisees, had all the knowledge in the world, and it led them to set up barriers between people and hate their enemies and not recognize God was standing right in front of them. 
See, Nicodemus stood face to face with Jesus. He had all the proof he needed right in front of him, but it was hard to accept because it didn't fit in his box of what he expected God to be like. See, I think we all have a box of what we think God is like, what he should do, how the world should work. And when that gets challenged, like when God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want or how we want or when we want him to, and it's hard for us to accept that he's good or even real. I mean, it's hard to trust him. It's hard to have faith. I think this is where Nicodemus was at. The things he had been taught about God didn't match his experience, and it caused him to question and to doubt. And this is a very uncomfortable place to be, but this was exactly where he needed to be. See, Nicodemus believed some things about God that were just not true or not the whole truth. And unless he started over, was born again, he would never really know God. And I think birth is a very accurate analogy for Jesus to pick. I mean, if you've ever given birth or watched a birth, it's traumatic, it's awful. And when it's over, sure, there's joy, but the process is pretty miserable. Nobody wants to go through the pain of labor. It's just the only way you get a baby. See, uncertainty and doubt is uncomfortable. It's the only way we get to new life. And maybe you're in a season of doubt right now and it's miserable. See, the good news is you might be on the verge of seeing God more clearly than you ever have before. And if you can just hold on a little longer, you might get to see God do something truly amazing that will change your life forever. That's what happened to Nicodemus. See, that conversation with Jesus ended with him telling Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, if you weren't confused before, you might be now. I mean, first it was a birth metaphor, then water and spirit, now snakes. I mean, this is crazy stuff. But Nicodemus would have gotten Jesus' reference. See, when Moses was leading God's people through the desert, there were poisonous snakes killing people. So God told Moses, put a snake on a pole and raise it up. And anyone that is bit just needs to look at that snake and I'll heal them and they won't die. It's a pretty weird story, but Nicodemus got it. And he probably didn't understand why Jesus was talking about it at the time. But a while later, Jesus was killed on a cross and raised up for everyone to see. We know that Nicodemus was there. That he was at Jesus' trial and he saw him killed. He saw Jesus raised up on a pole just like the snake. And I think then he got the reference that this is what Jesus was talking about. He was going to die. And that all people needed to do was to look to him, to believe, and God would save them. And after John tells the story of Nicodemus, he sums it all up with a verse you've probably heard a thousand times. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I think when Nicodemus saw Jesus raised up on a cross, he was certain of one thing, that God loved people and he was willing to die to show us. See, being certain of that one thing led Nicodemus to ask for the body of Jesus to bury him. This was a risky move because the people that killed Jesus were willing to kill anybody else that aligned themselves with Jesus. But Nicodemus risked his life because I think he was finally certain two things, that Jesus was God and God was love. So you might not have understood everything at that moment, but he was certain about one thing, which was Jesus. See, the best place to be on the certainty teeter-totter is actually right in the middle, to hold certainty and doubt in tension, to be willing to listen to views that you might disagree with, and be willing to admit, I don't know everything, and I might even be wrong about some things. And this is a humble approach to faith and life. And really, it's the approach that Jesus encouraged. See, Jesus never opposed the people that doubted or asked questions, only the people that thought they had all the answers. See, the only people that missed out on Jesus were the know-it-alls that refused to question what they believed. It is way more comfortable to just stick to what you know and never question it. 
to just sit at the bottom of the teeter-totter and never budge. But you might miss out on what God is up to. And you might believe some things about God that aren't even true. See, when you start to question, when you stand in the middle of that teeter-totter, it takes work and energy and it's exhausting. It feels like the most precarious position, but it's also the safest place to be because it leaves us open to being born again, to learn something new and not miss out on what God is doing. So where does that leave us? Well, first, doubt is a good thing. Questions are good things. Bring all your doubts and your questions to Jesus and bring them to church. See, doubt is what saved Nicodemus. Asking questions led Nicodemus to Jesus. Doubt is not a bad thing. You've heard the phrase, the benefit of the doubt. I mean, doubt only benefits us. Doubt can lead us to ask better questions and come to deeper understanding. Doubt is not something that makes us weak or not committed Christians. Doubt is necessary for us to be able to learn and to grow. In a neighborhood church, we don't have all the answers, but we are trying to get closer to Jesus because we are certain about one thing. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That God is love. That he loves us and he loves the world. And Jesus is the clearest picture we have of God. That he's the one thing we are certain about. And he's the one we can look to when we are uncertain about everything else. <laughs>